40% of Peru's population live on the Pacific coast, which is only 2% of the country's water supply. Across the Andes lies the other 98% of the water supply. In the future, we think that in 20, 30 years, about 50% of the population in Peru will be living in the coast, and that will be a complicated situation, very complicated situation. Peru's capital, Lima, has a population of 8 million people, making it the largest desert city in the world after Cairo, and almost completely dependent on water flowing from the Andean glaciers. Peru has lost over a fifth of glacier area in the last 30 or so years, which is the equivalent of 10 years' water supply for Lima. At the moment, Lima gets some of its water from a 37-kilometer cross-Andean tunnel, the Peruvian government plans to build another tunnel to supply the water that the retreating glaciers cannot. It'll cost around $1.5 billion. An alternative to compensate for the loss of water regulation in the Andes caused by climate change is go to the eastern side. Imagine you going around the glacier to the other side, an area that is undeveloped, and that serves the Amazon Basin that has not been tapped before. Well, that's an alternative. It's a short-term alternative, though, because in the long run, unless we do something very rapidly and very seriously, we run the danger of desertifying the Andes. And that will be catastrophic. But it's not just Peru's drinking water that comes from the glaciers. About 80% of power generation in Peru comes from hydropower. It could cost Peru up to $1.5 billion a year to replace that lost power. But the biggest impact of glacial melting is likely to be on agriculture. 15% of the global food supply comes from potatoes. And the Andean farmers are the keepers of the genetic variety of the potato. We have in Peru, only in Peru, 2,500 varieties of potatoes in the Andes. If the climate change will change or impact to these genetic resources, the humanity will lose a lot of possibilities in the future. In the Altiplano, there are communities that are vulnerable already to climatic conditions. If these conditions are subject to new problems, like for example drought, frankly the economic impact is extremely high for these families. Only about a dozen types of potato supply the global market. These farmers are one of the world's insurance policies against the threats of disease and pests. But if the glaciers carry on vanishing, a huge investment will have to be made to keep the supply of water to the potato growers. Today you have an open channel where you collect water that is graciously provided by these uh, glaciers. If you don't have that there, you'll have to do several things. The first one will be to substitute the storage capacity of the glaciers through engineering works, high altitude reservoirs and they are going to be very expensive. It costs of the order of one million dollars to ensure a one cubic meter per hour runoff. One of those farmers who rely on the runoffs is Santusa Signani. In her 76 years in the Altiplano, she's seen many changes, but over the last 10 years, she says she's noticed a substantial difference in the weather. The sun is much stronger. Before, it wasn't like this. It's now much stronger, and it's much hotter. The rains come, but the sun dries them up very quickly. I can tell that the sun is a lot hotter. But the Andes do have an economic asset. It's not immediately apparent. A multitude of different types of plants, in addition to the potato, that can survive in difficult conditions. Peru's Minister for Environment believes these could be worth a great deal of money as agribusiness searches for new species to cope with changed growing conditions. Until these times, we, from our Occidental culture, we think that the Indians and these poor people from the Andes, 
need to develop, they need to have more money, they need to have technology. Now we understand that they have preserved thousands of vari varieties of potatoes, of corn. They have preserved very good systems, ecological systems, to preserve the soil and have a natural pr production. And I think this lesson we need to preserve and learn from these people. How do we explain to somebody from the West the meaning of Pachamama and why we assume that the Earth is our mother? I think it's a fundamental difference in our cultures. Here in the Andes, life has been much more difficult, nature much harder to dominate, so perhaps this is one of the reasons why we believe that nature is our mother, that loves us, but can also punish us if we misbehave. And for that reason, we've learned to love her and not to exploit her. So how much could climate change cost the Andean countries? Well, according to a major study commissioned by the Andean Community of Nations, $30 billion a year by 2025, almost 5% of the country's combined GDP today. This may not sound a lot, but the poorest people are on the front line when nature systems are damaged, and they take the economic brunt of it. So what are the possible solutions? Man-made climate change is new, but changing long-term weather patterns in this region is not. Indigenous societies have adapted and will have to do so again. The World Bank is providing finance for a series of measures designed to make the best of the changes. The countries in the region will be among the first to implement pilot adaptation measures. And with that implementation will come a lot of knowledge. How much does it cost? What are the benefits? How to do it better? So they will be in a position to provide also experience and lessons learned to the entire planet. Another way to generate that cash could be by using the country's natural capital, trees. We know that in Europe, people have a real appreciation for biodiversity and protecting forests. We know that from the point of view of climate change, that in Peru, 50% of emissions come from deforestation. So we think we can cooperate. They can help us on the side of deforestation with carbon credits, and in that way, we would have enough money so that people could devote themselves to looking after the forests and not using it in any other way. Some analysts believe that this could net a country like Bolivia up to $1 billion a year. That's around a 10% increase in GDP. Sir Nicholas Stern nos habla de que el costo social de lo que... Sir Nicholas Stern tells us that the social cost of CO2 is around $85 a tonne. But nevertheless, in the marketplace, the price paid for credits is a lot lower. Latin America could aggregate credits in large quantities from industry, agriculture and preventing deforestation and could generate billions of dollars in that way. Well, there are a number of activities that Bolivia could undertake uh, in order to mitigate climate change uh, through the forestry sector. Uh, one obvious one is to reduce the emissions from the existing stock of forests by better managing uh, its forests uh, and also um, reducing the encroachment on forests from various sectors such as agriculture and energy in particular. The other thing that Bolivia could do is uh, in fact increase the forest area in particular by reforesting areas that were previously under forest but were cut over the uh, course of time that is called reforestation or afforestation depending on how many years the land has been without trees. So who are the people with a vision to keep nature in working order? In each episode of Nature Inc, the end note goes to the visionaries. This week we hear from the former Secretary General of the United Nations. He's calling for poor countries like Bolivia and Peru to get special assistance to cope with the changing climate they have had so little hand in causing. 
Kofi Annan argues that out of justice, the richer countries should pay the price for mitigating global warming. Governments will not take it off the top of their budgets, so we have to be creative and find means of paying for it. Today we have uh, carbon trading, but I think down the line we need to consider seriously a carbon tax, for example, so that those who are responsible for the pollution pay and we raise resources to help the poor and those least responsible for uh, pollution. Coming up in the next episode of Nature Inc, capitalism goes green. How the world's biggest banks and companies are investing in nature and making lots of cash at the same time. But can big business pull its weight in saving the planet?